I'm Alan Murray. I'm here with Monica Langley, who's written an extraordinary story, really the most detailed story about what happened at J.P. Morgan with these uh, trades that have now knocked $25 billion off the value of the bank. How did you get the story? Well, I've known Jamie Dimon for a long time. Um, I've covered him since he was a protege of Sandy Weil when he-, he You wrote a build, book. Right, when he helped build Citigroup. So I've seen him go through many crises over the years and I knew this was another one I wanted to tell. So now you have this story that's almost like King Lear. I mean, this extraordinarily proud banker, the last man standing after the ruins of the 2008 crisis, quite vocal about his successes, and then this Mm -hmm. trade comes right. along. Right. Uh, uh, how did he get it so wrong? That's the question everyone is asking. Even Jamie Dimon is asking himself, how did I screw up on this? And, and I what's did, the answer? That's what that, you've been reporting. Yes, exactly. So I did speak with him uh, yesterday on the 48th floor in their Manhattan headquarters. And um, I talked to many other executives as well. And what they have come to realize and what Jamie is kicking himself for is that he gave a pass to this controversial, now controversial unit called the Chief Investment Office because it had delivered so well for so long, it was simply a unit that was supposed to hedge any losses that the bank would have. It wasn't a quote, line of business. So he didn't extract the he same- He didn't ask questions. Right, he didn't do the same toughness that he usually extracts from his executives and it continued to just do well. The problem was, Alan, that over time it got bigger and uh, like after they acquired Washington Mutual and that kind of thing, it got bigger and then they realized they could actually make money on it and so the trades became a little broader. Jamie approved of the mandate for it to do more and it just, but it didn't, it never got the scrutiny that the other lines but of Monica, business Monica, what's, what's so striking about this is we ran stories in the Wall Street Journal in early April talking about the London whale right. and these big bets that were out there. So even we knew about it. It was out in the marketplace and yet Jamie Dimon called it a tempest in a teapot. Why didn't he see that the time had come to ask the tough questions? Well, he, that, he called that his first alarm bell internally, was when the Wall Street Journal reported that. But he went directly to Ina Drew, who was the head of that unit, and she said, we've got longs, we've got short trades, it, we're getting squeezed by the hedge funds, but I think we can ride it out. He took her at he her word. Her. He Why? did. Because of her track I mean, this record. Is not a, this no. is not a guy who is seen as exactly. gullible by Exactly, people not at all, and in fact, some of the other executives at J.P. Morgan Chase, with whom I spoke yesterday, are, are really a little resentful that she got a pass and they never did. They, they always got the tough question. Yeah, and one <laughs> compared it to you know a full body scan. Going in with Jamie is like, be prepared for anything. As you've known this guy for a long time, you've talked to an awful lot of people inside of the bank. Uh, uh, how do you explain the fact that he gave Ina Drew a pass on these big trades? Well, he said he was complacent. Um, because of, of its performance. He now says that um, what he said to me yesterday is a successful track record should give no one or no, no unit a pass. So he's back on his, you know, complete drive to be totally scrupulous about every detail. But, you know, I mean, the fact is that the, the people at this chief investment office, they felt in some way that he was endorsing what they did. He did, I mean, we report in the story that he, um, he basically blessed the concept of what they were doing on the hedges, you know, which led to these disastrous trades and the losses that are already over $2 billion. Monica, one of the questions this raises is, is a bank like JP Morgan too big to manage? Mm -hmm. Is it just impossible to really get your arms around it? How does Jamie Dimon answer that concern? Well. He says it's not that he screwed up. It was a mistake, but he believes that the mistakes they make will be few and far between, and they're going to learn from this. However, a, this is a big one. Yeah, yeah. It, and he realizes he's just given a ton of ammunition to the regulators and the politicians. He's already getting called into a Senate hearing, 
and all the regulators are swarming to find out what's going yeah, so, on. Yeah, so let's talk about the regulatory question. You know, we, we, we have this big debate going on in Washington over what's called the Volcker Rule. Right. Basically, what the Volcker Rule says is that banks can't make big bets in their own account, that they're right. basically in the business of servicing customers. The, the, the loophole, if you want to call it that, or the counter was banks have to be able to hedge. Right. So if, if, if a trade, you know, if they want to hedge a trade and make a particular bet to hedge a trade, uh, they should be able to do that. This was justified as a form of hedging. Correct. But was it really hedging or was it just a big bet on the market? Well, okay. Jamie Dimon has said that he agreed with the concept to hedge against, you know, at first it was that the market would move one way, that the economics would be one way, and then later he, that they saw that it may, they saw signs of an economic recovery, they could go a different way. However, this became so complicated and they did so much, so many bizarre, he said so many bizarre synthetic trades that it got out of control. Um, it is true that this unit performed well enough to become like a profit center, which is what the Volcker rule is designed to get. But if it's a profit center, it's exactly. not a hedge. Exactly. But, um, and, and, and he was that is, monitoring This is a big it. loophole. This, you're right. This well, is and a big he loophole. was, it's clear from your story, if I read your story correctly, that he was watching the profits. That one of the reasons that Ina Drew got a pass from the Jamie body scan was because she was making money. Well, hedges aren't designed primarily to make money, they're designed to hedge other... Exactly, but of course threats. in this low interest rate environment, they're not going to make a lot of money in that way. So they were making money here. And I think that that, I mean, even Jamie Dimon now says what happened here was not a he was not anything that he would have approved. He, he says to his, to his executives, they say, if he had really known everything that was happening, he would have said, not over my he, dead body. Look, but he, he, he's, he's been very upfront. He's gone out there. He said, my fault. I screwed up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's not going to stop the regulators in Washington from oh, saying, no. we have to shut this sort of thing mm -hmm, down, right? Mm -hmm, right. He knows that. that. The great irony of this is that he was the person <laughs> who felt like he had the credibility to fight Washington, and now he's handed Washington the biggest ammunition they could ask for. Right. And that's, that is the irony here. And even some of his directors are saying, you know, Jamie, maybe tone it down. Don't come after the regulator so much right now because he's been so vocal. But then at his shareholder meeting this week, he continued to say he thinks that a lot of these regulatory proposals are over the top, going to be too burdensome. But he then backs off and says, but there are some things about the regulations, maybe 70 to 80 percent of them that will be OK. So he's in he knows he's about to pay the price. In retrospect, does he wish he had been a little more low key in his criticism of the regulators? prior to this event? I no. didn't get him to, I don't think so. That's not his personality. That's not his style. You know, Jamie Dimon is, you know, a charismatic, very out there figure. And that's how he's become such a big force in this industry. And, you know, he's so, got a cult following. This is a big black eye for him. Yeah, but, so so the last question, what, what does it mean for Jamie Dimon going forward? Does it threaten his position as CEO of JP Morgan? Does it threaten JP Morgan's ability to grow? What, what are the long lasting ramifications well, of this uh, very expensive black eye. As you okay. Put it. Um, the loss could grow as much to $5 billion from these trades. However, when you look at the, pic the big picture of JP Morgan, it will not affect its financial status. They had net income of $19 billion last year. But so. shareholders, shareholder oh, value shareholders are, is shareholders dropped really, by 25 exactly, billion. Exactly, exactly. And so that is a question. At the moment, I see no efforts to say uh, Jamie Dimon is in any way threatened. In fact, a couple of people have said to me, we want him there more than ever because we do know he knows how to handle these kind of crises. And, and how about his public persona? Are we going to see a new, more humble Jamie Dimon in the future? That would be totally out of character. <laughs> <laughs> Monica Langley, great story. Very Thank well you. reported. Thanks. Thank you.